And we are back with another episode of The Julius Files. I have a uh, an entrepreneurial chronicle here today, uh, but I've actually, uh, it's a couple. This is uh, Steve and Melissa Fultz. They are both offers, coaches, consultants, entrepreneurs. Uh, and I was able to, I, I think I was pretty fortunate to be able to connect with Steve through LinkedIn uh, as we got into a discussion about him um, helping transition uh businesses from first to second generation, which is uh it's one been one of those where I have a a fascination for those different statistics and why businesses fail and succeed. So I thought that this would be a, a really great podcast to actually hear their story, but also bring on uh some powerful tools and information to help businesses succeed and and ultimately start looking for ways to help more second generation businesses succeed. Uh so Steve, Melissa, how are you guys doing today? Yeah, we'll be glad to. And I don't know, uh, do you want me to go first? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah, go okay. first. Um, mm-hmm. I have pretty varied background, but I was born into an entrepreneurial family. Uh, my dad started our family business before I was born. So it's I'm 57. The business is about 62 years old. And over the years, he bought a couple other businesses. But growing up, my dad never wanted me or my brother to go into the family business. He always encouraged us. So I, I did, a, I worked and served local churches for about 25 years, ended up getting a PhD in psychology, opened up a couple of counseling centers. I moved back uh, to our hometown and, and got into the family business in 2010. So um, in, in all that process, I had, um, when I got out of a local church, I got into a couple of businesses that, that uh, related to churches and business. And then when dad asked me to, you know, it, if I had any interest in taking on the family business, I said, absolutely. So uh, I'll never forget that day that he retired. He was still in town. But that Monday that I went into the office, I remember sitting in his chair and just being overwhelmed with uh, fear and anxiety. <laughs> it was like, oh, no, what? You know, what if I mess up what he's built? So it, it really, I took six months to sit around and smile and talk to people and not really do much. As I got to looking for, um, I guess as I got to looking for resources, everything that I could find was either an attorney or an accountant, what I would call big, big box consultants. But there was really, I couldn't find anybody that was a practitioner who was a few steps ahead of me. So I really started uh, talking to family business owners that were getting ready to transition to their second generation, and I learned a ton from uh, those people. And uh, I realized that uh, the only, I guess, the only constant was that there is so much diversity, you know, so many within group differences as as between group differences. But I'll tell you a, a really cool thing, and I'll let her talk in a little bit because I I came in the family business. We call it the Main Street. And she, I'm going to let her, she just retired from uh, Wall Street, but I'll let her tell you. And that'll bring us up to speed, and then we can talk a little bit about what we're doing right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not coming from an entrepreneurial family of in corporate America, and um, healthcare was really my family and my upbringing. So I was 20 years in corporate America, <laughs> worked with the largest health systems across the country, um, really streamlining their processes, consulting around medication safety, and, and medication management, a lot of the operational streamlining. So, um, you know, being married to an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> whether you know it or not. So, um, yeah, in 2015, we formed the Fultz Group, you know, knowing that I, you know, could see in the next 10 years, I wanted to work my way um, out of corporate America and really into more of the full-time coaching, full-time consulting. Um, so 2015, we both wrote our first individual books. Mine was a a business book background, more about internal alignment of organizations and how to partner better. Um, and Steve's book in 2015 was um, really about building a website um, for you know family business, taking that into the next next generation. So 2015, um, Main Street and Wall Street um, is where we began to collide. So that's been our our journey um, and kind of where it started and and where we're going. So yeah, and so I'll <laughs> I'll jump in. You can interrupt me. Uh, anyway with question or whatever but we we started uh, as i was looking at family businesses with transitions I, I noticed with the aging of america you know they talk about the baby boomers uh, 
PricewaterhouseCooper has some of the latest research, and that is in 2021. They did a huge survey, and at that time, um, 70% of business owners wanted to retire by 2026. So that was a five-year window. At that time, of the 70% that wanted to retire, only 20% had an actual succession plan in place. So what I've been finding, even the last couple of years, a lot of people are just closing the doors because they don't want to go through the effort to get it ready to sell, or they may think family doesn't want it or employees doesn't want it. So I've been having all kinds of uh, discussions. Well, when she retired and joined me, we're really working with small and medium-sized businesses on helping them find, uh, we're big on profit, helping them find at least six figures without increasing marketing or ad spend. And we do that with a framework that's pretty simple. There's no new, it's not like we've got any kind of magic dust. It's just uh, the basics, but the way we look at the chronology of the formula, people are like, wow, you know, I mean, I knew that, but I didn't realize that this little tweak would make such a big difference, you know, kind of on the bottom line. So that's what we're having a blast doing right now. We're working on our second edition of that book. It's called uh, Business uh, Business Growth Matters. And that second edition, we're uh, talking with small, medium uh, business owners, uh, really getting their perspective and their opinion about their industry. We're not, we just want to find out, will the, the principles that we have applied in several industries, will it work in other industries? And uh, we've gotten some good feedback from people uh, kind of sharing to see. And most of the time, we found a couple of industries that our framework is a stretch, but most all businesses, we can help them find that revenue uh, without increasing their marketing or ad spend. No, and it's it's been my experience that it's like um, the the tools and the concepts are pretty basic. And they do apply across different industries. It's the consistent execution of them. Uh, And I think that if you're focusing on profitability, obviously uh, that is one way to invigorate people uh, to get them to actually double down their efforts. But knowing the the, the failure rate of first, uh, first generation businesses and you dealing with all of the second generation businesses where the failure rate is even higher, what oh, yeah. w- what are some of the keys uh, that you would be coming into to see the second generation as far as mistakes that they are making when they are actually stepping in and trying to transition into that second generation? Uh, what are some of the things that, that the, the key mistakes you're seeing them make that you're able to come in uh, and correct to, to put them on a track of, of literally growing? Yeah, great question. And, you know, most time people don't go to school to be trained in the business that your mom or your dad, you know, started and had a passion. So in a lot of ways, you have to be comfortable being in the second row, you know, that seat of accomplishing that vision or whatever. But at the same time, uh, I noticed uh, the second generation people are, um, I think, maybe because they're younger. And I don't like stereotypes, but they're they're not as... um, Mm -hmm anxious about technology you know i can remember my dad and i'm turning into that I, we have to call our kids <laughs> can't get to revolt to work but you know i can remember my dad being really scared well what if i do this i don't want to lose you know on the computer or something like that um even my daughter is third generation is in the company too and you know she just buzzes through stuff i'm like sarah how did you know that I said dad i've been doing that since i was in you know middle school and i was like oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I will say uh, where I see a lot of friction is the different personalities. If the second generation comes in and uh, doesn't value or maybe too quickly makes changes, you know, I try to tell these people just stand around and smile and shake hands and kiss babies for a first year, you know, uh, you've got to earn that respect. I think a lot of times Since- the second generation feels like, well, my mom, you know, I'm, I'm my mom's daughter. I'm, I'm my dad's son. Or, so therefore I have automatic uh, respect. And as y'all know, that is not the case. It's got to be earned. And no, uh, I'm a, so I see, I'm a, yeah, go ahead. 
I, I, see, a, I see a lot of people <laughs> saying, well, my last leave is so-and-so, and the founder is so-and-so. Well, yeah. well, you need to listen to me, and you all know how that goes. And uh, right. but, but what I'm also finding is, you know, the, you are exactly right. The basic business principles are the same. But when you overlay, you say that circle in the business world, then you overlay the family side of it. You know, I have a brother that didn't, he's not in the business. Uh, I had an uncle that worked for me for a while. Um, I've got people that are closer in family. I mean, one of the business, we've got a guy that's been there 45 years. You know, so there's a lot of continuity. But when the leadership changes, sometimes if he or she is not sensitive to, you know, what's got the company to that place and if you're not respectful of that you really can burn a bridge very quickly then sometimes i don't know that they can overcome it you know depending on the level of destruction that he or she came in and and did but uh, so what we really try to do is get them talking and uh we're really big on speaking the unspoken and uh kind of clarifying assumptions because a lot of times we think we may know even what a family member wants or but uh, we're really big on, uh, we start with everybody around the table and we, we really air out some stuff. Now, we're not so naive to think in these first meetings, they really, un- you know, I, I used to say, we humans are a lot like onions. We have a lot of layers and we make people cry. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, over man. time with working these businesses, you, you they'll say, well, you know, we said this, but it's it really, funny. you know, you, you get to kind of the heart of it. If if the people's hearts are right and they're you know in the right place, they can overcome some crazy or uh, what I would say irresponsible mistakes. But if they're not, uh, you know, if the founder is such a different person than that second generation, uh, we found that it's really tough to make that transition. You know, um, so there have been some, and, I, and I've had a lot of founders say, I you know I love my son, I love my daughter, but they keep finding the door. <laughs> I, I won't trust them with what I built. So, you know, we moved to more employees and that kind of thing. So um, I've been a little shocked. At, uh, I thought it would be more of wanting that help to transition, but it's really not. It's wanting more. It's helping me find somebody else besides the second generation. And for whatever reason, I don't, I haven't gotten enough data maybe to know that, but but there's a great market, and right now is a good time for a good, profitable businesses to be sold on the market, as you all know. It's it's a fun space. So, are you saying that are you saying that you're actually finding more founders reaching out to you uh, rather than the actual second generation that has gotten themselves in the position, but are humble enough to realize that they don't know what they don't know, so they seek you out. Yes, but it's more of the founder because, like you say, I, and and I've get some random. We, we're doing a lot of video content, and it's kind of the long tail is just kind of telling my story. And I am getting some of the second generation is like, you know what? I they're wanting me to do this. I'm torn. I don't know if I want to or not. So we have some of those conversations. But more than not, it's the founder saying, you know what? I I'm getting tired. I want to hand it off to my. You know, the second generation is not interested in I don't want to just close the doors. So I am getting, I've been surprised at that. Uh, and I've only been focusing on this family business maybe for about a year. Uh, but okay. I have been surprised at the number that said, you know, my, uh, the family, they don't want it or I don't yes. think they're ready to take it, you know, as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm uh, today, I don't know these podcasts you try not to, but I'm 57. And when this is shot, um, but my dad, you know, a lot of people my age, if you grew up with a profitable business, I had a little bit of what I call a golden spoon. And I wanted what my dad had immediately, like microwave mentality, you know, whereas he spent 40 years busting it, saving, you know, and then I come along and like, well, this is pretty cool. Let's keep doing this. But, you know, he had the work ethic. He, he paid his dues. I wish I had, you know, he saved money. I can tell you a story after story. My dad wouldn't let us print in the office on just one side of the paper. You know, we did two sides. You know how much that he out? <laughs> but he just, uh, they don't make them like that anymore, you know. So that second generation is, there's just a lot of layers that uh, differentiates them from the parents that started it. 
And all of those situations can create, as you might know, some landmines, you know, that uh, people don't understand that I stepped in something that didn't have a clue that it was even there. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and I mean, I, so I guess I'm, you know, but, you're, you're totally fine. Yeah. Because the thing okay. is, is I think that um, entrepreneurs tend to shoot from the hip and play by their gut. Uh, so that's where I'm sitting there wondering uh, if I'm from the consulting side of it, where Melissa has been able to, I'm assuming, step in and bring a little bit of corporate structure, uh, which is needed. Yes. I mean, it's like bringing those big business tools to small business so that they can yeah. actually start to have a, a corporate light mentality where it becomes more about the systems, the processes, the numbers and actually functioning and operating a business rather than just sitting in the chair and being like, well, I'm, I'm my dad's kid. So now I'm just supposed exactly. to be able to run it and it's just supposed to run. Uh, I Melissa, know. I mean, how have you been able to, uh, to contribute to that as far as yep. the process development itself to, for the consulting side, to be able to deliver yep. something workable, uh, to that next generation or through that transition if, if you bring in another uh, <laughs> entrepreneur? Sure. Um, no, I think a lot of times we see, especially in family business, um, the owners and even second generations, they're all hands on deck in the business, working in the business just to keep it afloat. Um, and they don't spend enough time working on the business. So it's that you know kind of 80-20 rule of really stepping back and giving them time and giving them a structure that allows them to just take a step back and work on the business, um, which really is during transition. You said the word transition. Um, to me, the transitions between, you know, first gen or next gen or, you know, between founder and a new, you know, the, the transitions are key. Those are times when, you know, to level set, um, you know, to, to kind of evaluate, okay, where are we and where do we want to go? Right. Um, you know, looking at, it's, you know, anytime you travel and, you know, you put in, you know, where you're going, you got to know where you are before you can, you know, get the directions to go there. So that roadmap, you know, taking that time uh, and transition is always a great business, valid business reason is what I'm always looking for um, to do something different. Yeah. And uh, just on you, you hit it on the head. She really helps me. I am more of that uh, shoot and then aim guy. <laughs> so, uh, but also she has that um sets of uh completion and thoroughness so we we really complement as a team we can go in because most family businesses uh whether officially or not uh the spouses are i mean it's their life it's their livelihood and you know i said it in our book i i was born into it i don't know i can't remember a day that my dad he's never worked for anybody else he's been you know, he's, he's owned his own business since he started. And, um, I tell her sometimes I think I'm unemployable. I don't know that I could, answer <laughs> but, uh, she, she gives me a, um, a, a, a grounded perspective when we go in and she sees things and picks up on things that I really miss because of whether it's ADD or, you know, squirrel, I mean, it could be whatever, but she's like, oh, wait a minute here. And, so we've been able to really work well um, with family business in particular, but most business owners, their spouse, if they are married, they're a partner. The partner is very involved uh, in the business too, because it's just it's their livelihood. You know, most people own a business for time freedom and money freedom, and then they become a slave. Both they have no time yeah. and no money. <laughs> they pay everybody else for them. So that's why we've really enjoyed. You got to you're in business for a reason. Make profit so you can have free time. And so you can have, you know, enjoy the financial without the financial pressure as well. Well, and I mean, I'm, I guess I'm trying to look at it from your perspective, from the consulting. And I think that, uh, that, that the two of you is a pretty complimentary package because I think that I know one of my superpowers and I, I look at it as, well, I'm no better or worse than anybody else, but where, where am I different? I, I think yep. entrepreneurs have the ability uh, to <laughs> hyper zoom in and hyper zoom out. And I think that the hyper zoom out is where a lot of people in corporate America that, that, that they lack 
that ability. And that's that vision of being able to have the 30,000 foot view and, mm-hmm. and then zoom in to the ground level three foot view and actually work on a detail and then zoom back out to see how the work on that detail is affecting the whole bigger picture. So when you can go in and understand where that founder uh, is coming from and that entrepreneurial mindset, and Melissa is able to come in and say, okay, I understand you're seeing it from over here, but let's focus down in and work on it from here. Because it is that if you're going to lead a business, you have to be able to zoom in and out constantly to be yep. finding the problems and making small adjustments and then quickly zooming back out to see, did you in fact make an improvement or do you need to focus back in and make yep. a different adjustment? Uh, I mean, would you say that's a fair assessment? I think you just nailed it. And that I've never heard it explained that way, but that ability to zoom in and out, I think is a differentiator for sure. Pat. And, and, but you know what? Entrepreneurs have to. That's the thing. If and in corporate America, they've got a staff, and they don't. They may not have to, or they don't. They choose not to. But but you you've got to be able to uh, perfect that skill for sure. Well, and I think that that's one of the other things that I have learned over time in the team building aspect is that most corporations and big businesses start with the CEO, and they get the COO and the CFO, and then they start building their tree down. Uh, entrepreneurs yep. stepping in day one do not step in with that luxury or that know-how or the money to be able to build like that. So they have right. to start at the very bottom basic frontline person. And as they're withdrawing themselves, start to fill in that picture as they rise up in the levels. And it gives them a different perspective. And it, that's why the hard part is moving away from working in the business and starting that zooming in and out to work on the business. Uh, and it's yeah. for that first generation, that is a hard hump to get over, much less oh, yeah. somebody coming in as a second generation and saying, oh, I have to develop this skill set so that I don't lose the respect of the frontline employees while still trying to fill that role that the founder actually built uh, and and developed yep. a customer base out of. Yep. And we think too, we see, you know, the founders, they've done it a certain way. They've done it this way. It's been successful. So sometimes they're stuck in their ways a little bit more so. So Mm -hmm. that next generation coming in, you know, how to validate even their unique strength so that it accentuates Mm -hmm. um, and it complements the business. And it's not a cookie cutter. Um, You know, how to let them in the right time, build the respect, but also use their own, you know, unique strengths to get it to that next level to grow it. Um, that it gives them fulfillment, you know, as well. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the founders that, uh, were having a difficult time handing it off to the daughter or son. Uh, it also says a lot about that founder, you know, some of them are more ready to do that than others because some, their identity is wrapped up in the business. You know, there's not a lot of separation between who I am as a person and who I am as a business owner. So in some ways, handing this off, I'm changing role. And I don't know that I, you know, that the, they're kind of lost. So it's almost an educating the founder as much as they're educating that second generation too of coming in that about equally respecting the position of the other generation. Um, and all that depends on, you know, the whole history. How, what kind of relationship have you had with your mom or your dad? Or, you know, the founder has it been rocky? Has it been, you know, there's, there's, as you can imagine, there's just not a, a pattern that's predictable because we humans are a lot alike and we are better off together, I think. But um, it's it, it's been a, a fun thing because I've lived it and I can relate, but there are some common themes, but there's also a lot of nuances too. So, I mean... I am a, I think it just comes down to my nature because it always worked well as far as receiving to me. Well, uh, when you find this next generation coming in, I, I guess what I'm, to get right to bluntly what I'm asking, they have to find humility 
The question is, yeah. are you able to tactfully massage them into finding that humility yeah. or or do you have to deliver tough love and ruffle their feathers before you go back and smooth it over to actually get them to be coming at this from the proper perspective so that they don't destroy it in the process when it comes to I mean, because you don't get that knowledge transfer from all of the people that are operating in the business if they don't respect you or see that you have the potential right. to truly take that knowledge and, and move it forward. When it comes to, uh, I guess, breaking those eggs, uh, are you able yeah. to, have you found a way to do it in a, a nicer way or, yeah. or do you just have to come in and actually uh, start delivering tough love and be like... Well, Hey, that's what you brought me in for. She reminds me a lot that I could be a little more tactful. I'm very direct. I tell people, I don't know what to share. I'm sorry. Because I just have kind of one year. But we do have a four week. Well, we're kind of doing it in eight weeks, but it's a four session every other week. Uh, kind of a, a digital course that I, I haven't taken a group through, but I have done some people. I want to take a group. But the very first week addresses exactly what you're saying because that's a that it starts with that and we call it the uh, the people in the business. So as that second generation he or she is coming in, you know, uh, you have to assume they may know the people in the business or they may not. They may be lived across on the other coast, you know, and uh, the founders becoming ill or you know has a diagnosis of a terminal illness or something quickly you know so you can't you can't assume that the second generation knows the people in the business so that first week we talk about the people in the business and we start with the person which is you is. you know about how you're gifted how you're skilled what we we kind of combine some personality tests but we really look at how do you really function and then we go down the management team you know we let them look at those people how are they wired and then maybe one more level. So that person spends some time really getting to know himself or herself as well as the management team. Now, she's really a lot better at asking good questions. I'm probably a little more direct. and um, But it's hard. Uh, I can't. Sugar is very important. And it's like you said it earlier, if there's not that respect between the founder and the second generation, our job is... Uh, I don't want to say almost what's well, almost impossible because we, and we've said to people, I don't think we're a good fit for you. Yeah. Like we, we don't want to just, help we don't anybody. want to do family therapy, yeah. which sometimes it, you know, it, yeah. it, you might need a little bit of that. I try to drag you in and, you know, we can make referrals <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But this is, it's really about business. It's about your family's li- livelihood, your legacy. You know, you've got a founder that's poured life into it. Um, so we don't, we don't treat that with kid gloves. Um, and in general, it's received well, but who knows? After we leave, they may say, you know, these people, what are... We think, we think it at least gets their attention. So, But that yeah. that eight-week program covers four topics, but we start with really learning who you are and how you fit with your team. Well, and that's the thing right there is it's like, I think that ultimately successful entrepreneurs realize that they're not building their business. They're building their people and their people are building the business. But when you get a second generation that comes in, they have to find the humility to say, I don't know what I don't know. So if I'm ever going to actually lead this group, I'm going to have to let them build me which means yep. I'm going to have to go to them for that knowledge transfer before I can collect up all of the knowledge they have and inevitably apply my new generation thoughts and willing to embrace technologies of today to actually take it to a higher level. But they've got to spend that first time earning that respect and letting those people transfer that knowledge and build them. And it's that that's, it like at our age, that is humbling to be able to yeah. say, like, I have a fair amount of confidence and wisdom, but if I'm going to step into something new, I'm going to have to go to the people that know. But addressing sure. that as somebody that is in their 
late 20s and early 30s when they still haven't developed that wisdom, which is that young and dumb, we think we know better than you. They haven't gotten out of that right. phase. Right. Um, that is a very humbling thing that I'm like, maybe that is part of the cause of why the failure rate is even higher because they're not able to find that humbling place to go let that team build them and thereby not only does the knowledge transfer but the respect is actually built does that sound like a fair assessment i think you're very uh very fair and exact actually and if you think about it some of these and it really depends on the relationship of the family and you really never know this till you really uh till you drill down and get to know more but it uh how did the founder treat you know the second generation as they were coming up did did they have to work did they did they value uh you know hard work do they value i mean are they an honest person do they have integrity character all that kind of stuff because you know we've seen it all if you've got an entitled person all the way through when the founders raised up you know they they expect it well what do you mean i have to buy this from you you know i just you, you need to give it to me and what do you mean i have to listen to these people i know what i'm doing so that entitled thing carried all the way through is a disaster. But but if you've got a family that's, you know, as as they grew and as they were productive and profitable, but they they valued hard work, they knew the value of the of the dollar, you know, they knew to save, they knew not to get over your head in debt. Those kind of things you're starting when they make that transition, it's much smoother than the entitled golden spoon, you know. And I, I think that as a couple um, we do have a uniqueness a little bit when it comes to family dynamics. I think, you know, if just to, for an example, say, you know, the, the father's the founder, um, you know, he's wanting to hand it to his daughter. And even though his wife, um, you know, is in the business because it's family business, um, you know, meeting with them as a couple, sometimes it, it changes the natural, um, just kind of patterns anyway. Cause we're, since we're meeting as a couple and meeting them as a couple, it's it takes a little bit of a different dynamic if there is a power struggle yeah. um kind of a mediator that that you know the mom might be able to mediate a little bit more but just bringing that spouse into changes the dynamic um and that's something unique i think as a couple that that we're starting to see so i i want to change gears here um because I, I, a lot of what I want to talk about as far as my overall is the, the realities of entrepreneurship. And I think that they just apply to first generation, second generation. Um, some of it though might actually apply to this day and age because I, I have questions for people that, that I, that, that will, they're just not your standard entrepreneurial questions, but some of it is how I've actually grown up myself living in what I've embraced. But I think people need to be aware of these things. How do you feel about anxiety? And I'm saying that I want to frame it that anxiety is my friend. Like anxiety yep. tells me where I need to direct my attention. Uh, I had a friend of mine several years ago that recommended CBD oil to me because I, I've always lifelong had insomnia and I tried it. And it literally wiped out my anxiety to the point that my business could have been burning down in front of me and I would have just sat there and watched it. <laughs> um, so I, I quickly discontinued taking that CBD oil because I was like, no, I depend on my anxiety to tell me where the problem is and where I need to be focusing my energy. I don't do anything to suppress my anxiety it's like part of my sixth sense where I look at it as a friend, but I see a lot of people in this generation that they are fearful of experience of anxiety. They want to <laughs> automatically run out and, and, and search for medication for it. And I'm looking at it going like, you need all of your senses when you're in entrepreneurship uh, and, and, and anxiety is one of those feelings that you're going to experience. How do you guys actually feel about uh, anxiety as, as a personal experience? Now, I, I don't know right, you answer that. Yeah, <laughs> I can go. No, I, and, and as you were talking, I was thinking about that it's a similar concept of, uh, 
you know, if you think about stress, a lot of people say stress, I don't how it affects my body, but you know, there is you stress, which is the positive stress. If you're getting ready to perform, you know, they talk about Olympic athletes and all, they kind of get right at that edge and there is a point of diminishing your returns. But if um, the you stress is like, we're on our game, if you're getting ready to speak or you're getting ready to, so, so that anxiety can help. Now, distress is probably the negative form of that. So with anxiety, I like how you said that. I do think it is a uh, barometer or a, on the gas, you know, that you got something that's <laughs> peaking some anxiety. Where is this coming from? And I'm kind of like, you, I, I, I hope that the anxiety I can funnel it and it's a, it's a source of uh, positivity more so than a roadblock or an obstacle. But I do think, especially with entrepreneurship, um, I think people that uh, we uh, are wired a little differently. <laughs> The type A, I don't know. I hadn't done a lot of that research about type A and, uh, uh, you know, perfectionism and all that stuff and how they anxiety. I, I don't know the correlation, but I would think we can uh, learn a ton by uh, listening to our bodies and then seeing what the external events that are causing that internal, you know, reaction. Where, where I think it's cognitively at first, we start about thinking that way and then. We start feeling that way and then behaving that way. So um, if we can change how we think, it may change our feelings, which may in turn uh, affect our behaviors too. But I think it's part of life. I think, and there's a pressure. You know, you talk about a race car when it's going around the, the edge. You know, that that's, I've used to know those, the speed they were going and how they're, what, centimeters from the car next to them at that speed. You know, they're, they're just on that teetering of um, uh, flipping over or going too fast, whatever, and that's their sweet spot. So if, yes. we, if we as humans could learn to dial it in like a car could, <laughs> yeah, I think we could get a lot more done than what we actually do. <laughs> you have something to add to that? No, I, I think it's very individual. I think um, you, you hit on it a little yeah. bit. I think anxiety, there's kind of two camps. It either, you know, it does, it propels you forward and you lean into it or it paralyzes you. So I think you, we, you have to kind of assess, you know, it, is the person just by nature, um, you know, are they, is it a paralyzed thing? And then you can, you know, I think then walk them through a different, different path versus being the, you know, the kind that you kind of embrace it. Yeah. Um, I also think it is a little bit generational, um, you know, coming out of corporate America. Um, I think it was a unique time because I worked with you know, about five different generations or decades, um, sure. you know, people in their 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, and 20s. And, you know, for those in their 50s and 60s, when they look back over their career, you know, those that were, you know, 40 and 50 years older than them way back then, it was, they were a lot more alike. I feel like because of technology, um, the generations are a lot more different, <laughs> yeah. the younger ones coming up than what, what we're used to. And I saw it a lot in corporate America. I love that this, you know, generation in their 30s is talking openly about mental health and anxiety, where... You know, the 50 and 60 year olds, they have a harder time talking about that because that was never something that we talked about. So I do think there's generational things that um, that play in that fascinate me that um, it's always. Yeah. You know, I love the psychology behind all that. No. And the thing is, because I mean, I do. I mean, I I, want to stick with this for a second just because of something you said. Um, The fight or flight response is real. And as you said, anxiety can paralyze some people okay. have you guys ever found yourself in a position when you're consulting where you literally just determine like you're literally telling the founder you don't want to do this because the psychology of the person that you're hoping will take this over that they quit are going to quickly lock up and get paralyzed with anxiety their automatic response is flight and you have to have an automatic response of fight in order to actually carry uh, yep. this position. Have you had times and instances where you've been like, my recommendation is you don't move forward with the second generation because they don't have the right personality type to be able to reproduce what you're doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, let me, I'll, I think because we, we would approach it differently. Um, I think Steve would be more apt to say, 
they don't have what it takes. I think <laughs> I it's easier. I, I would rather they know it anyway. I, the founder knows whether the second generation has it or not. Um, and they know if they don't. And so I think it's more of them leading. You can lead a horse to water, you know, and but they have to come to that realization on their own. But it's asking those probing questions. A lot of times they already know. No, because the funny thing is I look at you two and I'm like, the old me, I would be like Steve and I'd be going to the founder going, sorry, kid, don't have what it takes. Yeah. Like, But uh, Melissa, yeah. I can see your side of it to be thinking, okay, well, how can I ask this founder questions that will get yeah. them to openly admit so I don't yeah. just have to be brutally honest and say, your kid doesn't have what it takes. <laughs> right. Yes. And maybe they've hired yeah. us to tell the kid that because maybe they can't. So oh. again, it's getting drilling down to those roots mm-hmm. of the why we're there <laughs> and what we're a lot of discovery um, up front and it's really key. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of one or two examples where that kind of come there. And I, I wish it were that clear. It sounded like I wish it, I could say, but it was almost a, a, a culmination of several things, including, you know, the person doesn't have what it takes to make it happen, you know, at any cost to me because, you know, when you're sitting in that chair, you it, it, the buck stops here, and you it, are you either going to make it or you're not. But I, I don't know it's been that clear to say that anxiety is a reason. I don't think the person that's ready. But we have come to a conclusion a, a couple times saying I don't know if this is a good one. And well, and I, I think I, what, no. I it, it, my thing is is like I look at all of the reasons as to why first or second generation fail. And when I look at this generation, yep. I potentially see anxiety a, a, as a reason yep. why they could fail. But th- th- then we go to the other side of this, because again, I, I guess I should clarify. I told Matt that one of my personal goals, if you will, in life um, was to cut the failure rate of entrepreneurship in half. And he was like, impossible. And I said, well, I know how to cut it in half. Get half of them to not even try. And at the yeah. same time, I am i don't want to step on people's dreams. I want people to analyze themselves and be more real with themselves and get themselves to the place of realizing I am not capable of being number one. I don't have what it takes. I have entrepreneurial yep. aspirations. I'll go be number two for somebody else yep. that does have what it takes. But 7% get into entrepreneurship. Well, if 3.5% of them would just simply be able to search out information that would tell them you don't handle anxiety well, you right. are not built to for, to be number <laughs> one. But then I transition into the next things that I do think contributes to my success. I yeah. reject victimhood and mentality because personal accountability means everything to me. Yeah. And I think that that personal accountability has been what's led for me to lead with accountability as part of my culture in my own businesses. So I know accountability is a cornerstone for any type of success in in life, but specifically in entrepreneurship. How are you two going about uh, building in accountability into the systems or into the culture, the coaching and the consulting um, with that next generation to get them to understand that, you know what, it doesn't matter if it's not your fault in a leadership position, it's always your fault. So that yep. accountability is how you earn the respect of others. And again, we get back to, you can very clearly see if they're not going to get there, if they're automatically going to play the victim and look for the entitlement, that's a very yep. clear key that they're going to fail. How do you yep. go about communicating that or building that into their program? Well, yeah, uh, I'm, I'll jump in right here. We, we've yeah, actually the last week we had a and um, it's hard to hold somebody else accountable. I think what we we talked about it, we kind of put it down on the table, look at every side, angle, and all that. But when we looked at it, it's more about ownership. You know, uh, the person has to say to, they got to take ownership 
to, to hold themselves accountable, he or she, that's doing that. Now, how we go about doing this is literally, and this is a way oversimplification, but as we're walking down with the founder, the second generation, and that's who we try to focus on. We don't really get into the top management of the organization, but mainly the people. But we like to think that we're holding up a mirror in some ways, and, and then by asking the right questions, I believe uh, mm-hmm. the person mm-hmm. can teach himself or herself uh, about, you know, really the challenge areas and the, the positives. And we try to look at how you're bent and how you're wired and focus there as opposed to spend all your time on that area that may be lacking. You know, I, I don't know that we want to take that leader and try to make him or her well-rounded as much as we want to say, you know, that's with what brought you in here. And then we're trying to find out what that is. So in some ways, I guess, if we do our jobs right, that person is going to create his or her own accountability um, criteria, whatever that may be, as as we go down three there. Um, but you said something, too, that I wanted to piggyback on. We're, we're also a people that we believe that uh, we can change where we have positive changes we're also people we believe in abundance we're not in a scarcity mindset i think there's uh, enough out there there's an opportunity for everybody you know some people are like oh no i don't want competition we believe that a rising tide you know all the boats go up so in the, um in in several of those uh, more i would call it more philosophical concepts but that kind of paints the picture with our founders and second generation of how we would approach uh, making the transition and the handoff. And it's not a quick process. You know, this, uh, ideally, it'd be great if you had two to three years. I got to sit outside my dad's office for four years, and I literally learned the business by listening to him on the call. And um, I probably could have had four more years. <laughs> but but if, if you have a two-year uh, runway and you... Uh, have it broken down that we have milestones, you know, in these two years, it, it makes it very much, much more smoother than somebody saying, I just got a diagnosis. You know, I've got, I have two weeks and then I'm not going to be around in, in the business, you know, so that, two different uh, ways to approach it. I guess. And I'll, I'll add a little bit too, like, you know, going back to the working on the business versus in the business, um, you know, by, just mm-hmm. by hiring and working, you know, with consultants and you know, bringing somebody from the outside in, they're spending the money and carving out time to, you know, if, if they're going to be wasteful of their time and money with us, but, you know, it, it, they're ready to be accountable. That's why they're ringing us in. Fair point. <laughs> so, I mean, I get, and I mean, because I, I honestly, I, I had a question that I wanted to ask and Steve already touched on it, but this is a, so if anxiety could kill you in entrepreneurship and accountability could kill you in entrepreneurship, one of the what? problems that I'm seeing with this generation uh, is a problem with uh, delayed being uh, the, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm trying to pull the words down, delayed gratification. Yes. Yeah. What do you think is a realistic time frame for success to occur in an entrepreneurial journey, whether it be for first or, or second generation? Because I think too many people think that they should be able to put in a couple hard weeks or a couple hard months or or even a, a year or two, and now everything is just supposed to be gravy, easy, easy streets. Um, and and I don't believe it to be that way, but I do ask people like, what it, what do you see as a a realistic timeline, whether it be a startup or a second generation for truly now, getting the plane off the ground? Yeah, and uh, boy, I think it's such an open ended question, and it's so dependent on that individual, you know. I, and I have to come down to it being mindset. I think. And I know for for me, because I, again, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My dad has been, he's, you know, he, 
I don't know, it's probably been a part of six or seven businesses, you know, two or three of them fell. Most all of them did well. You could sell. Um, but, you know, that's such a hard question to answer. Other than, um, it, it, to me, it's, um, it's a characteristic that the entrepreneurship and she was, we're, we're second marriage, so blended family. And she was telling me because both of my girls are also pretty entrepreneurial. My oldest works in our, she runs the admin for three of our businesses. And then she's got two little businesses on the side, what I call side. And also my youngest has a retail store boutique for um, children. But I think it's because they've been around my dad forever. They've been around me. And that's not all positive. If you're in that, you know, the entrepreneur mindset of, I start a lot of things. I don't follow through on a lot of things. I mean, I can take for every good thing, I can tell you two or three challenges with that. So, uh, but I think until that person really grasps that I am, this is who I am and this is how this affects me. Um, for me, it came to where I had to put people around me, including my wife. She has a sixth sense that I wish I would have had. I, I, I've gotten into a couple of really bad business decisions for with partners that you know the red flags were there, but I just didn't see them. I'm pretty literal and pretty whatever. I think I'm insightful, but I don't think I am. Uh, she, I saw she has, yeah, she, <laughs> that woman's intuition. That, I know. that woman's well, intuition no. has not. I that's I, I, I. Yep. I know. I'm <laughs> like, I can't help it. So, but but I I have been burned uh, before her. Since her, she <laughs> saved me from being burned at least three times. <laughs> so now I try not to take a meeting without her. I'm just like, you know, because I, I know me. I, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for opportunity. <laughs> and I have I think the last few years I've learned to stay in my lane. And when I get outside of that lane, it's more aggravation and trouble and, and normally costs me, you know, than <laughs> staying in my lane. <laughs> I just listen. I, uh, <laughs> to the trying to stay in between the bitches. <laughs> we should hire ourselves for our business. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm right there uh, with you. That Sometimes I have to remind myself that I'm supposed to be listening to my own advice. I get it. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I have a... Uh, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, I want to piggyback just a little bit because I'm, I'm trying... We try really hard not to do stereotypes either. Uh-huh. Um, we are Gen X. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so we, we've raised, right. um, you know, I've got three boys, they're all in their twenties. So I raised, you know, part of that, I raised that generation. Um, and there it is a different generation. And I, I used to worry, um, you know, I would tell him, you know, how they would, I worried about their interpersonal skills, you know, cause they were it, always on their devices and they would be in the basement playing video games with their friends who were in their basements. They just never had. And I'm like, this generation, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, well, this is our future. But you guys, then COVID happened and yep. we went <laughs> digital and we're all like, oh, I'm missing our crave. I can't, you know, build relationships. I didn't miss a beat. So I feel like society where we are culturally knew that that, you know, they're ready for this. So where we may see it as, um, you know, a, a setback where they don't <laughs> want accountability or they're looking for, um, you know, instant gratification where we, yep. our generation sees it differently like they may be able to use that as a strength. Um, so I, I don't rule it out and try not to, to define it's, you know, problems with this, but you know, how is it, how, how is it adjusted today? Um, we, they have, you know, I, I look at mentoring up and mentoring down. I have younger mentors and, you know, that are in their twenties and thirties that I can call and go, what does this acronym mean? Or, you know, um, I think if you should mentor up and down, um, have those that are, so that was just my thoughts as we were oh, talking no, about. Oh, no, be- because, I mean, you touched on something. In. Yeah, because I grapple with this, and I mean, and you made a fair point. I'm I'm not big on patience. I don't have patience. I, I, I'll be honest. I don't even try and have patience. But I do have a realistic expectation for the time frame and the amount of work that's going to actually have to be put into something. So a generation that doesn't have an appreciation for gl- for delayed gratification great you had better be willing to really put in the work now if you want to get a result now and i think that that's the balancing act of i've learned that a realistic time frame is you don't get it now like 
even if it's something small, you're still going to put in a week's worth of work before you get it because realistically yeah. there is that delay in the gratification. But more often than not in business, no, you shouldn't have patience because patience will just slow you down. But things mm-hmm. take three, six, nine, 12 months in order for work that you're doing to actually start getting a ball rolling where I think delayed gratification is something that all generations would do well. It, 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 some of the negative anxiety that they run from, if they had more realistic expectations and more appreciation yeah. for delayed well, gratification, right. maybe they wouldn't battle that delayed or that, that anxiety that they're so quick to actually run from. Yeah. So I, I heard them. Then we get, to, well, I, Go ahead. Related to that, I heard this uh, last week on a podcast. They were talking about uh, our kids don't know how to be bored anymore. If you think about it, you know, like growing up, we had talked about I'm bored. We would play until dark, you know, and I lived in the country. We never locked doors or anything. But, um, you know, we would sit around and throw rocks under a tree. And the, the podcast, they were talking about how our kids today they don't know how to be bored. And parents don't want them to be bored, so we keep them. You know, stimulating. Overstimulating. So, yeah, overstimulating. Yeah. Um, but that delayed gratification. Well, and I'll, tell you, and I'll, I'll be honest, th- that yeah. right there is, uh, I w- it, this was this was the last question that I was actually yeah. going to feed into with you guys. Yeah. So my, I, I, it's like, I don't think that um, trying to focus on many things at one time is healthy. Like you can juggle a lot of things, but you need to really focus on something and then quickly move from one to the next. But when I'm on the phone with Matt, I'll just totally flip him out because my brain will like, I'll get the the input that I need from him and then I'll go left and then uh, I'll get the input that I need and I'll go right. And he said something to me that just totally, like I have been pondering on this question because it has really stuck with me. He said, you're afraid to be bored, aren't you? And I really yeah. started thinking about that, <laughs> that like most people will work Monday through Friday, maybe Saturday they'll do something productive, but Sunday they take the day off. That is where that unhealthy anxiety that I feel, I have to accomplish something seven days a week. I always have to be doing something so it was such a off the cuff comment that he made, but yet to me, it was such a profound <laughs> thought that cool. I do struggle with. I don't like being bored. I always yeah. want to be feeling like I'm taking steps towards something. So yeah. how do you feel about boredom? Does boredom scare you? Or rightfully, are you making another point that, that maybe being comfortable with boredom that there's a that there's a certain healthy factor to it i'm gonna step in first because <laughs> i i mean as again in <clears throat> serial entrepreneur you know long long line that um I, you know there's a difference between boredom and stillness so you know i stillness and being still um I, that's where even sleep that's where our bodies heal itself you know if you're not sleeping well I mean, it's the best medicine you have. So I, I think, um, and me being the person that, um, I, from an ADD standpoint, noise just, I have to get and, and have a quiet and some stillness sometimes. Away from so I, I make, you know, difference between boredom and stillness, uh, two very, very different things. So absolutely. Well, I agree. I wish, uh, cause I'm a lot like you, Miss. I like, I, I don't, and I wouldn't say in the seven days, I'll just have to feel productive. I, if I'm not, I feel like I wasted these last three hours. What did I accomplish? You know, I didn't create content. I did the, you know, and I try to look at it in blocks of time. Um, I, I want to learn to be bored again. Um, I, but, but I think for us, it's more of our stage of life right now. Um, I do know that, you know, people talk about work-life balance, and I just don't know that I am fire that way because, you know, there's some things you got to do that's going to require everything you got, but you're going to pay your dues now and enjoy for years. Or, 
you know, the other, but I, we're, we're coming on and telling that, uh, we do value free calling. We do value, uh, peace of mind. <laughs> so that's why we're very selective with who we work with. And, and it's really because I've filed over the years, that, you know, I spend more of my time with the people that pay less and more headaches with, you know, so we're, we're going after that, that, uh, business owner that's pretty savvy and has some self-awareness and, uh, can afford that. So, but we are making a conscious effort to be bored again and build in. And I, and I, I don't know who, which book, but okay. there is an author at one time he's talking about margin and it's not the dollar. He's got like not Henry Cloud, but if you think about a piece of paper, how's the margin in, in that as a productive person or entrepreneur? We don't like a lot of white space, you know. Even in my notes, I'm all over. I, I even go, I, I go across the market, and I go up and down. Like uh, so now I'm trying to make myself just take notes in the very center of the of the page, you know. So, but long story short, I, I hope I can learn to be bored again. And I don't. For me, I don't know if that's um, insecurity. You know, I don't know if I feel like I got to be productive or I'm. I, I, I'm trying to figure out what that means because I want to be okay just be, you know. That's what I want to challenge all of you all. Yeah. I think the word boredom is, um, I think put that in differently. Sometimes doing nothing really isn't doing nothing. Um, again, the difference between stillness and boredom. I don't like the word boredom, but I like the word <laughs> stillness. There's something whole and healthy about stillness. Um, boredom, I Mixed me Nancy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we really answered your question. Probably not, but it's a fascinating concept that I'm going to no, follow now. You know, that's the whole right there because I'm a very yeah. big believer. Change your perspective, change your life, uh, and be open yeah. to receiving perspective and your life will change. And I think uh, there's a lot of people in the younger generation that, and, and, and it may be, it's not this generation. It's just all younger generations that they haven't got that wisdom yet to realize who yep. you are in your 20s is not going to be who you are in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s. My and the more malleable you not. are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's the thing. But but in that time, they are so rigid about these are my beliefs and I'm holding on yep. to them forever and this is the truth and I'm like, but it's not you. You have so much more information to gather before you can even get to a well-rounded perspective to say, okay, I've collected enough information that I'm pretty solid that this is my viewpoint and it's not going to change. And you just cannot have that type of wisdom in your twenties. So encouraging them to be more willing to let other people's perspective challenge your perspective without being yeah. offensive about it, without ratcheting up your anxiety, looking yeah. at it as a, oh, that was interesting. I'm going to let my brain chew on that and see if by some chance it doesn't change my mind. Uh, and I even, my, my own team, they know they're allowed to challenge me because one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm going to hear their argument and it's going to strengthen my conviction that I know that I'm right because I heard from a different perspective, or I'm going to consider that they might be right and it's going to stop me from going in the wrong direction. And we're going to find a better direction because I understand I can't always be right. I can't always have the best ideas. So I'm open to their challenge because I'm always open to a fresh perspective so that I can take in more information to make better decisions in general. And again, we come back to working with and coaching and consulting for that next generation. Those yep. sometimes are tough pills to swallow and you've kind of put yourself in that place um, yep. as to where that's the, the vein that you're working down to try and get them over those humps that they're going to get over the hump one way or the other just a question of how much pain are they going to endure in the process that's okay well, now only oh. one you know the clowns might be out but you mentioned perspective give you a, a, a example that to, you can use with by the way you said it's perfectly if you look behind the sister porch with the box said when you see 
happened. So, you know, most people say, I'll see a light, we see candles, I see window, whatever. But I used to do this a lot, and I've never had somebody say, I see the window paint. And, and so we talk about that with perspective. If you put a tent here, or if I change that window, if you think about what all of us look at in lens every day, Blind, I have to have this, so. but if we started to think about changing our perspective that we're all looking through and and it's a little <laughs> easier to swallow we think we need to change our window pane sometimes but absolutely and that's what? the looking for those fresh lenses and sometimes yeah. uh somebody from the outside looking in can c- come in and point out such a basic problem but you're looking at it every day and it takes somebody yep. from the outside smacking you upside the head saying you keep glossing over this because you see it every day but this is a right. major problem yeah. that you need to be paying attention to right yep okay so you guys say that uh that you're developing uh continually developing content where yep. can you be found uh for, yeah, for people it, to find yep. you to to find out more about you, your books, your practice, your offerings? Yeah. Good question. We, we are, yeah. uh, our website is Biz Batters, <laughs> which is B-I-C, Growth Batters. And then on LinkedIn, we do quite a bit on each of our first pages. The company page is almost finished. We do, uh, I've got a YouTube channel. We both put a lot of content in. And it's mainly on leadership, leadership development, uh, sound small business, you know, folks are non-profit, but just real quick, uh, things like that. But probably the best place is that website, bizgrowthmatters.com. Okay. Melissa, do you have anything that you would like to uh, to add as, uh, I guess, as we proverbially land this plane? No, I just think it's been um, a great, uh, I've enjoyed our, our conversation. And thanks. thanks for having us. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Well, well, I'd really enjoyed uh, talking with you and getting to know you all. I hope we can keep in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for coming on. Like I said, it was a, I, I think it was just a by chance thing that we happened to connect on LinkedIn. But uh, yeah, I have these personal passions in general. And when I, when I saw what you did, I was like, you know what? I, I think that potentially there's value here. Uh, for my that. audience, for for the people that actually listen, um, because yep. again, I, I hate to see the failure rates because yep. I know firsthand the path of destruction, the the ruin that is in the background yep. from all of the failed entrepreneurial journeys, and it's like, okay, what what can we do to uh, reduce that, to limit it, to stop people yep. from from falling into those types of pitfalls, whether it is first or second generation. Yeah, I think it's a great mission that you're on. And, uh, I, I really enjoy speaking with you, and I'll, I want to follow you too as you, as you do more, at least. Wonderful. All right. Well, we are. We're, uh, we, we will wrap this up. I will say that, uh, like I said, if, if you know anybody that needs to hear this, uh, please share the show. But All right. Well Until next time. Appreciate it. You guys have a Thank good night. Y'all.